Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about failure theories, introduce the concept of how we understand something to fail, at least in the static sense, and specifically look at ductile failure theory. Uh, in the next one after this, we'll compare that to brittle failure theory. But before we can get started, let's talk a little bit about why we have failure theories. So under static loading, that is the situation where we put some object, some material component under a constant load, or the time frame that we're looking at, the load doesn't really change. We have some P that is constant. Within that time frame of it being constant, we can apply static failure theory. Now static failure theory does not mean that this is the this load will only be ever be applied to it. Uh, but rather it means over the time period that we're looking at, this is the load that's applied. Uh, and we have to approach this understanding that there are basically two different ways that a material can fail uh, outside in under static th failure theory. So we've already talked about how a product can change shape within the elastic region. Uh, now we're going to be talking about moving outside of that elastic region. So let's, so let's go back to that stress and strain diagram for mechanics and materials. Um, so as we put some stress on a material, uh, it causes some sh shape deformation, and usually there's some elastic region uh, that follows Hooke's law, and then at some point uh, there's some deflection, and then there is some breakage. Uh, so the point at deflection is where it starts to yield. That's w why we call it the yield point. Uh, the stress which causes it to yield in tension is called the yield strength. Uh, and the stress which causes it to break is called the ultimate strength in tension. So we, most of these tests are done in tension. So we have two different uh, types of materials and two different ways things break. Um, so we have two different types of failure. Uh, the first type is when something deforms, uh, so it changes shape. And the second type is when it fractures. Uh, so when something changes shape due to uh, a certain going stress beyond the yield strength, uh, we call that a ductile failure. And when something begins to fracture and crack, uh, and instead of changing shape, we call that a brittle failure. So all brittle failure is crack propagation. So tiny little micro fissures that exist within the mat every material uh, begin to cause separation of material and a crack begins to grow uh, when you pull on these parts uh, strong enough. So the difference uh, between a ductile and a brittle material is how much strain it takes. So a ductile material will begin to fail uh, when the strain which causes that failure uh, is greater than about 5% so about 5% strain. Uh, a brittle material has fails uh, with that fracturing behavior at around under 5%. So the strain that causes failure uh, is equal to or less than 5%. Uh, so materials can be both ductile and brittle depending on their situation. Uh, the famous situation, of course, is steel. Steel is usually ductile, uh, except for in certain environments. You put it in a saltwater environment or in a very cold environment, uh, such as a ship, and it can turn brittle. Uh, of course, the part of the sinking of the Titanic was the bolts shearing off because the steel became more brittle, uh, and it was a cheap steel. All right, so the things that we need to know about are the yield strength of a material, Again, these are usually done in tension, and the ultimate strength. Uh, a brittle material may have both a yield strength and an ultimate strength that are really close together, uh, but because we don't really care too much about it, uh, there, there won't be much distance between those two. Usually brittle materials, we just are concerned about the ultimate strength and yield strength for ductile materials. Uh, so we use the SY for yield strength and S. Uh, UT, ultimate strength and tension, uh, for the ultimate strength. Uh, so we can compare the stress that we're under 
to the stress that would cause it to fail, and this is where we come up with our factors of safety. Our factor of safety n is the strength of the material over the stress it's under. That is, we have some material property over the actual loading it's under. Uh, so in situations like civil engineering, they'll have factors of safety between 5 and 10, so the stress is 5 times less than its strength. Uh, oftentimes in mechanical engineering, we'll see things more like 1.25 if it's a low risk situation, maybe up to 4 if it's a safety device. Uh, so what the purpose of a factor of safety is, is to account for the things that we don't know. So we assume we know the load and we can figure out the stress depending on that load. But obviously we don't always know perfectly what loading is going to happen. So factors of safety exist so that we can overcome the, this uncertainty about the loading type, about the material type. So, so even though a material may have a known yield strength, a particular sample of that material may be higher or lower than that. There's some inherent uncertainty in that. All right, so because we have two different types of failure, we have ductile failure and brittle failure, we're going to have two different failure theories. And the reason we have failure theories is there can't be any exact law, no universal law, which says that this material will always fail given this loading. Instead, we come up with empirical tests and produce theories. So we're going to have ductile failure theory, that is, if a material is going to fail in a ductile way, we believe it'll fail in this way based on our empirical test, and we'll have brittle failure theories, which says based on, our, again, our empirical tests and this brittle failure theory, we pr propose that this material will fail in this way.